thank you very much. I'm really thrilled and honored to have been invited by the Manhattan School for Children to participate in this event. It's very exciting, the work that you're doing and the way that you're sharing these ideas uh, and this, these strategies in your school with the global community is something that I really want to recognize. And I also wanted to mention, um, I didn't hear France in the list of countries with uh, viewing parties, but my parents live in France and they're viewing right now. So just wanted to make sure France was included. <laughs> so, so, and in particular, I wanted to thank the student presenters who have shared really great work and shown the courage to come up here and speak in front of a large group, which at their age, I was terrified of doing such a thing, and doing so with a lot of uh, their personal voices and their humor, which I really enjoyed uh, being exposed to. And thanks to the teachers and the families who supported those students as well. So today I'm going to try to explore factors that contribute to lasting learning. And I'm going to, along the way, I'm going to try to explore what a sustainable learning process might be. So take that idea of sustainability and apply it to the, the learning process. And what I'd like to do also is focus on an important concept during my talk, which is photosynthesis. So unsustainable learning, maybe we could start talking a little bit about that. What would unsustainable learning be? So some issues or challenges facing science education today nationwide include a lot of classroom learning is forgotten after the test. It doesn't last. Sometimes it doesn't last through the weekend. There's something called summer learning loss where students at the end of the summer have lost and performed significantly lower on tests than they would before the summer vacation. There's even weekend learning loss. And I've heard of an administrator who uh, expects the teachers in the school to give tests at the end of the week because at the beginning of the next week, the students would have suffered weekend learning loss. So what is this kind of learning that's so fragile and ephemeral? Learning should last, right? Also, kids lose interest in school because learning is seen as memorization of facts. In fact, a national survey that asked kids what words came to mind when they thought of school Two of the most common words were bored and tired. So that's not good. And kids don't learn to learn or develop self-awareness of personal, their own personal learning process and what their own personal interests and curiosity are. A few other facts that I thought were interesting to share with you today. The average hours of daily homework has increased by as much as three times for some age groups since the 1980s. Teachers say they have to rush to cover vast amounts of content that they're required to teach, a very common comment from teachers. And yet, in, in science, the United States rank is declining when you compare the 34 OECD countries. Those are advanced industrialized countries. And now stands at about 17 and 25th for math. And I think to put it in context, Canada is around fifth. So what is it that we want more of? What do we want learning to look like? Well, we want learning that lasts. We want big ideas and key concepts that are going to really be basic to the way we think about problems and issues. Um, we want learning to learn and love of learning, right? We need to, to, to love the process of learning so we can become lifelong learners. We need to develop self-knowledge. We have to know who we are personally and our own awareness and self-awareness. And we need to learn to problem solve, which is something that's come up so much today when we've talked about sustainable development. Um, and what are the habits of mind and the skills that we need in order to take on new and unseen problems that we've never experienced before? So we want those habits of mind and we want the problems that we're passionate about to be real world problems. That TEDx video that we showed really focused on that, solving problems that are, that are urgent to people around the world. So what I'd like to do next is show you a video passage uh, which asks graduating college seniors a basic question. The video series uh, is called the Annenberg Learner Series, very interesting one, and I, I, I can provide the URL if you're interested. And what those interviewers do is ask graduating seniors basic science questions to probe what they learned from 17 years of school. If you think about it, by the time you're graduating from college, you've been in school 17 years. That's a pretty long time. So this seemed to me an important way to test the sustainable, sustainability of learning, right? So I chose the photosynthesis video. There's a variety of different ones that focus on what causes seasons, different types of topics. And I chose it because of the connections to today's projects, many of which address plants, right, and photosynthesis. 
And also, we learn about photosynthesis repeatedly during that 17 years of schooling, right? Comes up again in middle school, somewhat in elementary school, in high school. Um, and again, for today's conference, it's very important for understanding climate change. So what is photosynthesis? Well, photosynthesis is a process by which green plants and some other organisms use sunlight to synthesize foods from carbon dioxide and water. What the interviewer is going to ask graduating college seniors is, here's a seed. Imagine it's planted in the ground and a large tree grew. Now, where did all of that stuff, the wood, come from? So while viewing, please try to answer the question yourself. Cambridge, Massachusetts. Graduation day at Harvard and MIT. Here's a seed. Okay. Okay. Now hold on to that for a second. Okay. Imagine that I planted that in the ground. Okay. And a tree grew. All right, and here is a piece of that tree. Sure. Okay. Now, where did all that stuff come from? So where do plants come from? You look at these beautiful big redwood trees, these great spreading valley oaks, and you know they start from this little tiny seed. It's miraculous. Where does all that weight come from? Oh, the mass came from a lot of things, I'd guess. I'd guess from water, that it sucked up from the ground. I would guess from minerals that it sucked up from the ground. Water, light, soil. Well, I, I mean, I suppose in terms of just in terms of raw mass, most of it's probably derived from actual like matter in the soil itself, and uh, some of it comes from water, obviously, um, but a large amount of it comes from the, the nutrients that the I guess the roots uh, absorb from the soil. Now, what would you say to someone who said to you that most of the weight of the tree came from the carbon dioxide in the air? I would say I would have no idea. I'd have to think about that. I would disagree because this same volume of air wouldn't weigh this much unless it was highly compressed. I would say that's very disturbing and um, wonder how that could happen. It's a very strange idea that somehow the air, which they view as nothing, as weightless, as insubstantial, somehow makes a tree, a giant tree that weighs several tons. I mean, that's absolutely incredible. That'd be hard to believe because carbon dioxide is, well, it's a gas and it doesn't seem like, it doesn't seem intuitive that you could add mass taking in a gas. But that's where it comes from takes those carbon molecules and packs them together via chemical reactions so tight that you get this huge mass. So what does it mean that these Harvard graduates don't understand the fundamental idea of photosynthesis? Well, it's symbolic of the state of the nation. These are the best that we produce. They don't understand it. After all these years of school, who does? So did, how many of you guessed uh, carbon dioxide before you saw the video? Good, good. So I put on this slide, at the top of the slide, the equation for photosynthesis. So water, liquid water, and carbon dioxide gas. Uh, and light in the presence of chlorophyll, right, um, produces sugars or biomass, or in this case, wood, all the parts of the plant, and a byproduct, oxygen, right? So students are taught this equation in middle school, high school, sometimes elementary school, college. Well, I wouldn't expect the chemical equation in elementary school, but, and the graduates say the wood came from soil and water, but soil isn't in the equation. Soil, nutrients, all that stuff is not in the photosynthetic synthetic equation. And water contributes almost nothing at all to the mass of the wood. In fact, the soil and all the nutrients in the soil contribute one one-thousandth 
as much as the carbon dioxide. So a young child's intuitive idea about how plants grow, if you ask a young child who hasn't had any schooling about how plants grow, you ask them that question, they would say, well, soil and water and light. The college graduates' ideas are very similar. The students' ideas were the same before and after their classes. So some failure must have occurred in the learning process. So what failed? How might we teach photosynthesis for real learning? Well, the first thing that I would propose for sustainable learning is to teach in a meaningful context. So in projects like today, many of those students would have learned photosynthesis in a class with a lecture, using a textbook, and it wouldn't have been connected to anything really um, else. Um, the projects you've presented today talk about nutrients and different growth media and insects like aphids that eat the plants. Um, so those kinds of projects make learning meaningful. Also, we need to work on student misconceptions about gases. We need to find what those misconceptions are and address them. So let's focus on misconceptions for a moment. From early childhood, before kindergarten, we've been making meaning from our observations, often developing ideas that are not consistent with science, like our ideas about gases. So we think of gases the way we've experienced them as a kid, right? Actually, I brought here a little prop. I didn't bring it because I was a Spider-Man fan, but this is what we experience a gas to be. It's part of our experiences, right? Generally, research shows that children think of gases as just nothing, insubstantial. They don't have matter in them. Gas is all around us. You can't feel it, right? So how is it that you could take a gas like this balloon and through photosynthesis turn it into this? It seems very, very hard to believe. Not only is the carbon dioxide hard to understand how it could turn into a heavy tree, but even the water. Think about the water. The plant takes water during photosynthesis and it splits it into oxygen gas, the very gas that we need to breathe. Before it went into the plant, it was liquid water, which if we know that liquid water, if we fall in it and can't swim, we can drown for lack of oxygen. The plant takes that very material, converts it into the oxygen that we breathe. Another difficult idea. Understanding photosynthesis requires a good understanding of gases, specifically gases are matter with mass and volume, and chemical reactions can cause gases to become solids and liquids to become gases. Teachers need to focus students' work on existing knowledge, including key misconceptions. And where there are misconceptions, classroom teacher teaching has to surface these ideas and build new ideas using them as a starting point to be sustainable. So what kind of hands-on activities could meet that challenge of addressing our misconceptions about gases, that gases are mass, they can be heavy? Here you can see one, an inflated balloon can weigh more than an empty balloon. There's a lot of investigations that can be used to demonstrate that gases have mass. If you take Alka-Seltzer tablets and you weigh them, in, like in that picture to the left, you weigh your whole system before dissolving the Alka-Seltzer tablet with the balloon, and then you drop the tablets in, and then you take the balloon off, and all you do is release the gas, you'll find that the, the total mass that remains is much less. Maybe as much as half of one of those tablets has disappeared as invisible gas. You can also show, you can do many different things to illustrate the properties of gas. CO2 mass is easy to observe when it's in a solid state, right? If you think gases are nothing, then what you could do is show. What I have here, can anybody guess what it is? Dry ice. Dry ice, and it's actually very heavy. And all it is is carbon dioxide. And you can do lots of tests to show that it's carbon dioxide. It's not gonna melt into liquid. If you collect the air that comes off it, it will extinguish a candle or a match instantly because a flame can't burn without oxygen, right? Intuitive misconceptions are modified by experiential learning, which leads to real understanding. So the challenges that we face, not all students go to school in a school like the Manhattan School for Children. Many, many classes 
uh, we tend to rush through the content. Many people say there's up to 10 times more information in a typical course than we can realistically learn. There's no time when you're doing that to make connections to existing thinking and surfacing student ideas and designing hands-on experiences that kids can make meaning from. And if you rush through it and you don't surface what kids already think, especially when what they already think isn't correct, then the new information won't be learned and the old ideas just continue unchanged, which is what you saw with those graduating seniors, right? So what can we do to make learning more sustainable? Teach fewer facts, teach less material, cover less, and focus on big ideas. Design lessons to surface existing ideas, like some of these activities I just talked about. And embed the learning in authentic projects. But this takes time, and it's really hard work to change your ideas. Project-based curricula exist. We should adopt them. Here's just a few. And even better, schools like Manhattan School for Children have been using these materials with resources that they're designing on their own that are local, like the greenhouse. So I work with the Urban Advantage Program, and the Urban Advantage Program promotes sustainable learning as well and has helped teachers to expand their science classrooms. Just like here, it's been expanded to include the greenhouse. We do it to, to expand the classroom to include the museums, gardens, and zoos in New York City. And actually, in this picture, all of this stuff is material we buy for schools. And this is a grow lab, a two-tiered grow lab for growing plants. We've distributed them, at this point, to about 400 schools that can now do photosynthesis and plant experiments in their classroom. So there's all kinds of hands-on learning that can take place, and this is happening all around the city at the cultural institutions. If we do more of this, kids will believe what they learn, becomes part of their belief system, and kids learn to learn. They can hypothesize, design experiments to, produ to produce observations. They can mine data from all different kinds of sources. They can make meaning of the data and the observations, develop claims and arguments, and defend their ideas in front of their peers, just like we're doing here. You can become familiar with your own curiosity. You can know what interests you, which will guide you as you get older. And you'll know how to guide your own learning and research, so you won't need a teacher to plan out a class for you to learn. You can do it on your own. And when you graduate from college, and even middle school or maybe elementary school, you'll know how wood is made and how a tree can help us cool Earth's climate. Thank you very much, and congratulations to all the students.